Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. What's up? We got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God. You made it. Yay. It's about time, Nathan. Damn. Shh. The movie's starting. I'm Nathan Simmons, and I'm a goner, too. You can see it in my eyes. <laughs> and why do fireflies have to die so soon? Oof. And this is... <laughs> Oof. This is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining and fucking anything in this movie. Oh, I told you <laughs> off mic that I'm just going to sit here mm-hmm. in stunned silence. That's all I got. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're starting. Uh, we've already had a very violent movie last week. Yeah. And then a very, I don't know. How, how would you describe Triangle of Sadness? Uh, it, it's got some comedy, but boy, what an ending. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a comedy that still punches you in the gut, right? Yeah, absolutely. In this movie, all gut punches, I would say. <laughs> All gut punches, nut punches, uh, throat kicks. <laughs> uh-huh. Like it's, uh, it's a hard. Th- I will. I'm going to throw this out up top. Okay. I. This is the second time I've seen this movie. Same. The first time I watched this movie, I said, "Okay, I'm good. I don't ever have to see that again." <laughs> and then you joined our show. <laughs> and then I joined our show, and I saw it on the schedule. And, you know, in fact, I I tried to pitch watching this movie with my fiance. Mm-hmm. That's changed since the last time we recorded. Yeah. But I I told her, yeah, it's about these two kids uh, trying to survive in World War II and she just goes I know what your show is <laughs> yep. like I know that that's not gonna go great that is kind of the thing with our show is like <laughs> once you realize what the premise is yeah any movie that gets put on the schedule even if I'm enjoying it halfway through I'm like oh yeah I mean uh, we, we've had that happen before where we won't tell each other about movies off mic yeah because we're like like we're like I was thinking about putting that on the schedule next season mm-hmm. and then one of us will go oh fuck thanks man now yeah. I know it has a sad ending yeah exactly there's like hey if I see this new movie in theaters i I just tell if it's good or bad i don't see anything else anymore (laughs) but it's also like prepared us to like talk about movies even if like like when we the weekend barbie came out Mm -hmm. i remember all of us being like what if it qualifies what if we can do and so like i'm sitting there almost hoping it has a sad ending Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) well i thought this was fitting we talked about this movie this week Mm. because there's so much that's happening in the world of cinema right now that revolves around world war ii we're kind of reflecting i mean we're almost 100 years out from it at this point we're not that far off right but uh with oppenheimer last year and even godzilla minus one yeah. if you can believe it big reflection on world war ii and uh post japan specifically mm-hmm. i don't know i just thought it was uh, appropriate plus i couldn't believe this but this is episode 173 we have yet to do an anime on this show right yeah which i thought was you know it was high time we do that mm-hmm. and not only that but with the relative property of not having done any animes we also haven't done any studio ghibli movies yeah which i don't i don't know uh, how many of those qualify not as many as you'd think i mean some of them have sort of like uh mysterious endings yeah. but they're, they're very rarely like this where you know you just kind of sit there hearing yourself breathe when the movie yeah ends. yeah I, I haven't seen that many studio ghibli movies i've mm. seen a handful but mm-hmm. uh I, I forgot this one was one of them. Honestly, sure. when, it, when the logo popped up, I was kind of surprised. Yeah. And for some reason, in my head, I was thinking this was a Hayao Miyazaki film, but it, it's not. Right. But this is easily, I would say, probably the most well-regarded Ghibli output that's not directed by him. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And the fact that this came out the same year as My Neighbor Totoro. <laughs> Wild. This was the, the third Studio Ghibli movie, if you can believe it. Bless. So, you'll recognize, if you're a regular listener, that right off the bat, you're not hearing a third voice mm. from us. And that's because uh, Mally had... In incredibly bad diarrhea uh, and couldn't join us. God. <laughs> that was my excuse for Triangle of Sadness. <laughs> it's going around. But uh, we actually, we got to stay at did, so don't worry. We got, we got someone to fill his shoes. Mm-hmm. I don't know what else to say. I mean, she's been on a couple of episodes here and I pitched, why don't you come on this one? And uh, I don't know, I feel like you were kind of iffy about it, but uh, let me introduce you. This is the wonderful, the talented, beautiful, the insightful, my lovely, my betrothed, Priscilla Hendry. Yeah. I thought you were going to say my neighbor, Priscilla. Oh, God damn it. I should have done that, shouldn't I? <laughs> so, Priscilla, did you truly want to come on this episode? Did you did you feel... No, I'm, I'm being serious because no, I, know I know you ask all the time, like, you know, should I come on the show? Like, what's a movie I should come on? Mm-hmm. And, and I pitched this one to you and you were you were down for it. So, why why did you want to come on this episode specifically? Oh, because I knew how depressing it was. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. That's a fair point. I think my first go was Triangle of Sadness. Mm. Yeah. Good pick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you lean a little bit closer to this microphone? There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, I was excited to be on this one. Yeah. And how'd you... You've seen it once before, twice? We watched it together the first time, and Mm -hmm. that was probably 
a year or two ago. Okay. Yeah, not that long ago. No, and then we watched it again, and I was like, oh. Still still depressing. Gonna relive this. <laughs> Do you two like anime? Like, I know you, you watch a little bit, Dustin. But We've I, I actually talked about it recently. Like, we should find, like, a good... Because we, we're always constantly hovering over different shows to start. Yeah. And I've pitched anime recently. And I, there's a couple on my... To watch this. I'd say I'm a casual fan. Like, sure. I don't get into the deep stuff. But, like, <laughs> you know, in my teens, I was really into the, the big ones, like Dragon Ball and stuff like that. But sure. also, like late night adult swim yu yu haka show and yeah. stuff like that and then priscilla you were into um what you were into bleach right or no Ber- berserk which one were you into trigon trigon Hell yeah <laughs> yeah and then wasn't there another one he was really into yeah outlaw star yes mm-hmm. my old band on our first record has a song about outlaw star because <laughs> i am a turbo nerd no i I'm, I'm the same way i i got really into anime in the sort of like the the boom in the 90s you yeah. know when when sunrise and all those other companies were really like putting stuff over stateside. Toonami really opened the doors in a same, big way and same. was huge into Cowboy Bebop yes, and, and yeah. uh, Gundam Wing and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I think now I have this sort of thing that it's sort of the streaming age in general where I'm like, there's there's too much yeah. to choose from. Yep, and so yep. when I do watch a new anime, it's typically a film. Yep. Like I, I love um, the, the filmmaker's name is escaping me right now, but the fellow who did uh, Weathering with You and your name and yeah. Suzume, like those are like I, I think he's kind of like the best in the game right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, show wise, I, I've I've really fallen back on. Uh, uh, I've been watching a lot of stuff that's just like nostalgia driven. Like yeah. I've been rewatching a lot of Ghibli movies and Toonami shows and stuff like that. But uh, it's hard to know where to start now. Yeah, speaking of that, we should also mention the Boy and the Heron. Yeah, saw it last night. Yeah, this felt appropriate to do right now, especially with the uh, the Oscars incoming. Mm-hmm. We'll see how well that movie does. But uh, no, I think. I think I'm in the same boat in terms of shows. I mean, I I find it hard to find anything that tops Death Note. Oh yeah, so I'm I'm hesitant to start anything else after that. Ashley just rewatched Death Note in <sighs> full, and it's it's so fun because it's it's one of those shows where like every couple of episodes the characters are like, we should all stand around and restate the plot from mm-hmm. the la- like recap everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it truly like I was kind of blown away at the writing of that show, just yeah. being like, this is how adult oriented anime can be, and I was really into that. But also like. Like undeniably silly in some ways, yes, too. The potato chip scene. I mean, <laughs> who can who can deny that? Okay, so Grave of the Fireflies. I, I think it's fair to say that we all enjoyed this movie, but we recognize that it is a tough watch. Yeah. I mean, if you aren't familiar with the film itself, I guess my brief synopsis is it is uh, mid to slightly post World War II, uh, set in Japan. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they ever say the ages of uh, of the children in this movie, but they're they're young. Mm-hmm. I'll say probably I don't know. What do you want to say? Like maybe four and eleven? Yeah, maybe. I'll give him maybe twelve. Or twelve. 13. I think uh, in the because it's based on a novella, and right. I think in the original novella they were, yeah, fourteen and four, something like that. I'd buy that. And it is uh, this 14-year-old boy taking care of his sister um, after their mother dies very early on in the movie yeah. due to um, fire burns from fire bombings over their village in Japan. Mm-hmm. And their dad, who is gone the entire movie in the Navy, so mm-hmm. they're left to defend for themselves. And uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, nothing good happened. Straight up. For an hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> Straight up. But like, it is one of those movies that I... I thanked God that it was only 86 minutes yes. long. I will say this thing, this thing moves like yeah. for a movie where it is relentlessly sad. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It tells a full story yeah. and it never, fe- it never feels like a slog, which is like so surprising. Well, it's interesting too, because I noticed on this watch, like a lot of this movie is not plot driven. Right. It is all character. Yeah. Like there's slice of life. Yeah. Like there's long stretches where nothing seemingly happens on paper. Right. Like it's Setsuko and uh, Seita just walking around yeah. and seeing the decrepit village and, you know, admiring a tomato growing on a bush, yeah. playing the piano and singing badly. Like it's really just from a child's mindset of kind of. Yeah, I, I watched a video um, after watching this movie where Roger Ebert reviewed this movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he had a great analysis of this director, especially in this movie, does what he likes to call pillow shots. Mm. And I'm sure there's another more, you know, technical term for it. But essentially, it's you'll see a character do something or say something that's somewhat revealing about themselves yeah. or about how they feel about the plot themselves. And then we'll just cut away to seemingly a, a non sequitur shot, like the outside of a corner of a building or like... Like just, you know, the side of a tree or something like that. Like something to just kind of reflect on. Yeah. Like 
because like you said, this is a slice of life and mm-hmm. we're put in the world of these characters. And so it's almost inviting you to think and feel alongside them, like how they feel and think. Oh, I mean, one of my favorite examples of that is, I mean, there, there's all the, the great shots towards the end where you're seeing how Setsuko like went about her day in various spots. Yeah. It's like, so devastating. Yeah. But like one of my favorite moments in the whole movie is when she's sort of getting emotional and the second that she actually opens her mouth to cry, Mm -hmm. he's just up on that you know, that he's doing pull-ups and doing spins and he's trying to make her laugh. Yep. And we just kind of linger on that shot for a long time because mm-hmm. that's what they can do for each other. Yeah. And it's like, you know, he he sees his mom's corpse basically Ugh. wrapped in bandages and burned. Yeah. And then we just cut to like the sky. Yeah. Like it's just, it's inviting you to feel a lot more in depth, especially because it's a cartoon. You know, it's hard to read their faces and their emotions like you could a human being. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I think it's for 1988 and being the third output that, you know, Studio Ghibli did. It's just, it, it is tremendous work. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go into it knowing that, yeah, there's some, it's it's basically just from the POV of children, just nothing good happening to them. But I'd say it's worth your time. And never really understanding why. Yeah. Because this is a war that has nothing to do with them. Yeah. And that's kind of the mindset of the movie is yeah. this all happens seemingly for no reason. Mm-hmm. And there is no winners. There's no losers. Or if anything, there's only losers, mm-hmm. I would say. Well, and, and the winners are blissfully ignorant. Absolutely. We'll get to that. Yeah. At the, yeah. That is a great, oh, man, That the, the, the women that arriving thing. home. Yeah, that's yeah. oof. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let me tell you some more details about uh, Grave of the Fireflies. So I mentioned the year is 1988, and I'm going to butcher these names, so I apologize up front. But the director, I believe, is Iseo Takahata. Mm-hmm. The film stars the voice talents, the, the Japanese voice talents of uh, Sutomo Tatsumi, Ayano Shirashi, Yoshiko Shinohara, and Akemi Yamaguchi. Mm-hmm. The budget was $3.7 million, kind of impressive for 1988 for an anime. Mm-hmm. And it managed to gross $13 million worldwide, so technically it was a pretty big hit, mm-hmm. especially with uh, all of the love it got from critics and everything yes it's one of the few movies that has the honor of being in the 100 percent on rotten tomatoes club for our show wow and uh, currently it is number 46 on indb's top 250 movies of all time wow Wow, that's a lot of depressed people. A lot of depressed <laughs> people. Um, no, I I think, and we've we've talked about this a lot this season. Actually, mm-hmm. Japan and Asian cinema in general just have always been killing it. Like <laughs> always since the beginning, since movies have been able to been made. Yeah, you know, you got Kurosawa in the forties and fifties and sixties spearheading that. Hell and yeah, and yeah, I, I I don't know. I I'm surprised it took us this long to do an anime on the show. But uh, if we're gonna do one, this would be the one to start with. I think. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking it was like either this or Akira. And yeah. I think this. <laughs> fits our show pretty well <laughs> yeah so i don't have an official drink of the film mm. but in an effort to liven this episode up because i know it's going to be all down from here mm. i thought we would do a couple of things here so priscilla and i went to we have a a, a local asian uh, market here that offers all kinds of different things from all different kind of asian countries korea japan china mm-hmm. and i got things that i thought were appropriate for this movie specifically okay so the first thing we got and it's unfortunate because I timed this exactly wrong, <laughs> is Sakuma Drops. Oh, the yeah. The hard fruit candy that uh, Setsuko and Seita eat throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. They, as far as I can tell, have been discontinued as of January of last year, 2023. No wow. My understanding. So, I didn't find those. But, however, I did find mm. the closest thing, I think. <laughs> it is honey laquat candy. Oh, yeah. And a word I've never seen before frittlery fertility what's this now so i'm pretty sure these fertility (laughs) fertility candies (laughs) (laughs) these were with like the holistic medicine Uh yeah i'm pretty sure they're cough drop but they says it says almond pear flavored refreshing and soothing candy it's hard candy in a tin like yeah you can't really hear it like that well, but oh, oh ooh, we're <laughs> opening it up. They're like individually wrapped little candies. They're definitely cough drops. They probably are cough drops. <laughs> now, are you going to pour these in water and then <laughs> gulp that shit down? Or? It says Prince of Peace on the packaging. Oh. <laughs> okay, have one. I'm, I'm going to have one. I'm going to have one right here. And we got a couple other things too. So just st- stick with us. Oh, this is definitely a cough drop. <laughs> <laughs> This is where you got those, uh, you got the peach flavored Lay's, right? Yes. Is that oh. what you had last night? No, no. Well, so it's, it was white peach beer flavored Lay's potatoes.
potato chips wild. from China. Yeah, they were wild. They were delicious. It was crazy. I want to try them. They like fizz what? in your mouth when you ate them. You got some fizzy chips? Were, <laughs> it was crazy. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, it's a cough drop. This, this is <laughs> definitely a cough drop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good thing everyone's getting sick. I love it. Uh, well, we'll have those on hand in case. But uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is more appropriate. At one point in the movie, uh, Seta buries up some some old belongings that he buried before the fire bombings. Mm-hmm. And in that hole with all his materials, he had pickled plums. Right. And so these are incredible. I'll have to send you a picture of these, Nathan. They're <sighs> tiny, tiny little jars. Okay. Are these supposed to be cold? No, no, no. It was room temperature. It is a pickled plum. It's the side of the of the jar says the added natural fruit is called ume mm-hmm. in Japanese. The fruit acid of ume balances the beautiful taste of choya. Okay. Which I believe is wine, if I'm not mistaken. So basically, these are Japanese plum wines with the plums in here. Okay. So they're in these little tiny jars. Did you miss the part where it looks like it's hard for him to swallow? I it? know. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm not a fan of anything pickled oh. or fermented in jars. So this See, I is... just like pickles. Mm. I don't go in for like pickled eggs. Oh, oh. <laughs> you just smelled it. <laughs> the scent. <laughs> oh, it's. Just, I mean, it's kind of. I can hear your eyes watering. <laughs> it's kind of like a like a dry white wine. It smells. Oh, like. okay. I know this is incredible for the listener, but <laughs> you know, trying to get in the in the spirit of things. You know, it's like they're under the table in an episode of Sex in the City. <laughs> We're just talking about. Oh, I got this white wine spritzer. I've been trying out these candies. So, uh, Priscilla, why don't you open up your pickled plum here? <laughs> you want me to help you? I'm scared. <laughs> you scared of this? Yeah, because I heard you making some noise. Well, it smells like white wine is the is the thing. So, oh my god, we did a wine tasting the other day. Yeah, it was <laughs> disgusting. Oh no, it was Why? so nasty. I, I love wine, yeah, but same. listen. Side note here: the little wheel of flavors that you could pick from. <laughs> they had like nail polish remover, rot- vinegar, rotten eggs. It was oh. like this is you pick on the wheel what you think it smells and tastes like, and it was oh. like old feed. Like it was a weird. <laughs> I thought it was. Was like I thought you were doing like the, the jelly bean challenge. No, with, like, no, 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 no. It might as well be. I mean, uh-huh. For me, it was crazy. It was such bad wine that even the whites and the reds all tasted the same. That's I don't know. Buck wild. It's bad. Okay. So, anyways, this smells like it. That's why I was. Oh, right. there's something in it. It's yeah. That's the whole reason. It's a pickled plum. Pickled Fuck plum you. wine. <laughs> <laughs> all right, are you ready? All right. Cheers. I'm really enjoying just listening to the international segment of our podcast. Oh, it tastes actually good. Okay. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your face is otherwise. It tastes like old raisins. Yeah, it's, well, I mean. Same. All right, you want to try the the plum? Oh, no. No? Oh, I'm going to try, try it. Oh, no. No, I don't. I have a feeling it has a weird texture. Mm, mm-hmm. Or it tastes like a raisin. Don't like either. It's just, it's just mushy. Mm. No, thanks. Okay. She's downing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you gotta finish it. No, 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 <laughs> no, she finished it. It was fine. You just didn't eat the plum. Are you okay? <laughs> I need a doctor. All right, well, doctor. The last little bit here, and then we'll and then we'll talk about the movie proper. I feel like it was appropriate. If we're gonna be talking about Japanese cinema, mm-hmm. and of course we're gonna go with some sake. Yeah, I had some yesterday. We got some little uh, koi fish sake cups here. Cute. I'll pour you a little bit. This stuff is strong. I mean, maybe not this, but yeah. any sake I've ever had before was... A sake to me, baby. <laughs> As Austin Powers once said, the great philosopher. The great philosopher Austin <laughs> Powers. The guy who's never said anything problematic. Mm-hmm. All right, cheers. <sighs> Woo! That's good. Good. See, this is this is where I'd have a problem. It, mm. just, it tastes like... Water? Not, like water. Yeah. But I think the alcohol percentage is very high. It is. Uh, let me see. That's how they get you. It is 12%. Hey. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like a, a real powerful beer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when we were in California, we went to a lot of like sushi places. Yeah. And we went to the sushi place and I ordered sake and mm-hmm. I thought it was just like a cup. Mm-hmm. And it, they brought me the whole bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I drank the whole bottle and I was like... <laughs> You were so, fucking hammered. That was hammer. <laughs> I, uh, so Ashley and I went to go get sushi yesterday, and a group of children came in and sat themselves. Mm-hmm. Truly, like just little kids, because you know how like parents will just leave their children at the mall for the day. Uh, I mean, we talked about that on Deadly uh, Deadly Games, That's right? <laughs> and uh, it became very clear uh, two or three dishes in that they did not have money. Oh uh, yeah. And then the whole meal became about Ashley and I 
watching this play out. Mm-hmm. Like I, tr- we we got amazing news from her family, and like we were just, I was like, I was, I'll be honest, it was mostly me, fully checked out, just <laughs> listening in on these kids trying to decide if they were gonna dine and ditch, if they were gonna leave one at a time, <laughs> and then they took off, and one of them left their shoes. Oh my like, god! It was, it was a whole production. I never had the balls to dine and dash. I'm no. gonna be honest with you. Why in the world would you do that? And if I was going to, I would certainly go to like I don't know, fucking cheesecake factory. Someone who could afford. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, maybe not cheesecake factory. Maybe that's a bad example because of the COVID and all that good stuff. But uh, I don't know. What's a what's a chain restaurant that could afford? I don't know, but like <laughs> you're right though. Like your first your first option is I'm going to go to the sushi place in the mall. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No. What if you just mad dog these people are like, like we don't have any money but like oh well yes we're gonna have to figure this out and you don't give you know, like, oh, and just see what these kids panic <laughs> like I I I want to do that as the dine and dasher and yeah. just be like I don't know I don't know what to do like you you made the food so just stare each other down <laughs> yeah <laughs> are you okay yeah you want it you want another glass half a half two and a half at this point you know you used to be able to like pay for gas like after you pumped gas mm-hmm. yeah and in, in high school and i had a boyfriend that would that would just like pump and ditch pump, pump and dump, dump. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to call it and he would just like ditch that's crazy <sighs> Ooh, that's bonkers that's what it makes me think of mm-hmm. the old times so we open on the death of a young boy <laughs> I was going to say, we're 20 minutes in, and now let's finally talk about Grave of the Fireflies. The first line of this movie is hard as fuck. It's Seta saying, September 21st, 1945, that was the night I died. Yeah. Like, you're already setting the tone right away with this movie. It is so smart that they start here, Mm -hmm. because we, you know, they're they're letting us know that this is a tragedy, we're going to watch a tragedy, and we're going to watch them reliving it, you know, in, in their final moments. It's... Told like the the narrative device of this movie is it's told as like flashbacks mm-hmm. after Seta and Setsuko have died, and it's interesting that Seta after death and even Setsuko after death never speak. Right, I found that interesting. Yeah, they reflect on their lives and they seem happy. I mean, the movie starts and it is Seta dying in a train station, yeah. amongst other children as people step over them mm-hmm. and call them bums and they, they're gross. It was the forties. I'm aware. The camera pulls back and we see that he's far from the only person that's died in the right. same way that evening. Right. And I mean, there is something we have to contend with, which is, uh, you know, the Japanese culture is far different from American culture. Their sure. sentiments are far different from ours. And they do view young children almost in the same way that they view adults. Right. Right? They don't coddle and, and baby them as much as, as we do here in America. Well, es- especially during wartime, where exactly. it was literally like everyone has to pitch in or or you're useless. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I I thought it was a bold way to start the movie. And- I mean, it's and then the can hitting the ground and the bits of bone falling out. Like, See, I told yeah. you. No, I, I had forgotten that was... Well, because because it doesn't make sense to me, but we'll, we'll talk about when we get there. Priscilla was insistent, yeah, that's set to cause bones. I'm like, there's no way. Look how tiny that hole I was like, is. Because I, I never noticed that. And I yeah. was like, well, that's really dark. Well, no. whenever... When you cremate somebody, it, it doesn't. It, there's still like tiny shards left right. over as well. Yeah. Well, that was my whole point. It was like when at the end of the movie when he buys the charcoal to cremate her. I'm like, yeah. we talked about this with Mandy. I'm like, you can't just cremate a body just outside with some charcoal. Like, I don't think it gets hot enough. Uh-huh. And that, yeah. And I was like, yeah, it does. That's yeah. especially a child. Why didn't we do that segment? <laughs> Will they burn? <laughs> <laughs> it's got, like a theme song. <laughs> but I, I mean, we do we do get snatches of dialogue because mm-hmm. she calls to him. Mm -hmm. whenever he crosses over and then you know there there's a couple of little lines at the end but you're right for the most part they are they're sort of taking a tour through their you know the last year of their life yeah and this takes place uh, well in in fact seta dies Mm -hmm. a little over a month after uh uh, hiroshima and nagasaki right so which would make sense that about a month you could maybe get by just doing little bits here and there like he does but uh, yeah and the the score Mm -hmm. with this theme song over the opening credits it really really gives you a sense of where where we're going Mm -hmm. because it's like this kind of like childlike piano, but very eerie. Mm-hmm. It's really well done. Mm-hmm. I, I I noticed the score this time around. Yeah, uh, written by uh, Michio Mamiya, who's uh, who's uh, written you know for operas and stuff. So mm-hmm. this thing has a very operatic feel to it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you have any uh, other notes, Priscilla, about this uh, b- about the movie before the opening credits or anything, or any thoughts, feelings? How we start? 
Just that it was really sad that he was just carrying around children bones yeah. in a can yeah. of <laughs> yeah. candy. In a can of candy, which <laughs> is the juxtaposition of the most joyous thing Setsuko feels in this movie, which are these little candy drops. Right. And then, you know, the reveal that her, her ashes are in there. Like, mm-hmm. I, just the juxtaposition there, I thought it was brilliant. I also love the moment when, they, like, they are re- they're reunited in the Fireflies. Their spirits are seeing each other again. Mm-hmm. They pick up the can and it's new again. Yes. Like, that little touch is so, so fantastic as well. Yeah. Yeah, the dust and the grime wash away in that moment. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So we start kind of right away, like in terms of like the what happened. So yeah. Seta is, is burying a bunch of his belongings in the ground outside his home. Mm-hmm. And the mom is going to go to the shelter early mm-hmm. and have uh, Seta bring Setsuko along with him. Yeah. Which I thought was wild. Yeah. I would, Like we were talking about like if our daughter, who she is about to be 11, mm-hmm. had to watch our son, who's about to be eight. They'd be dead. They'd be dead. <laughs> they'd be dead in the fire bobbins. Oh, my like, God. They, absolutely. They, they would not. Like, you have no idea. They, yeah. They're just like, <laughs> it, they wouldn't even last 10 minutes. We, we started watching this and, and uh, you know, Scarlett, Priscilla's daughter, mm-hmm. sat in and watched it with us because she likes Studio Ghibli movies. And yeah. about halfway through, she couldn't deal with and it. She and she was like, left. I'm going to go to my room now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, think, I think when my sister watched this with me, we were both entirely too young to process it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we were, you know, we were just like, yeah, we love Howl's Moving Castle. Let's, let's <laughs> right, watch Right, right, right. No, I couldn't imagine seeing this at this age, yeah. like what it would feel like. I mean, I guess it would be a lot of emotions processing at one time, but you wouldn't be able to really uh, explain how you feel about it, you know? Totally. But then, then there's, there is kind of little bits of comedy throughout this movie, mm-hmm. intentionally or not, but there is a little bit of levity. Like, I love when uh, Setsuko says, I, I don't like going to the shelter. I hate it there. And <laughs> Setsuko goes, well, it's better than that than dying in a bombing. Sure. And I'm like, Jesus, kid. <laughs> I mean, even there's even sort of like a funny moment where the, the jets fly overhead. They say, you know, these kids are so used to this routine already yeah that they're that setsuko's big thing is like she's worried about feeling warm Mm -hmm. in the shelter right Mm -hmm. like getting too hot in the shelter and there's like those little creature comforts that are that that also kind of give us a little bit of comedy they jump you know because they hear the jets overhead and then there's no explosion and then they literally don't see these bombs until they're right above them and it's a very dark moment that sort of makes you gasp but also like I don't, I don't know I had the, I felt all these emotions at the same time where it's in any other movie this would have been almost like a Looney Tunes-esque surprise yeah you know what I mean yeah like you'd almost imagine like a North by Northwest like uh, parody yeah right there which they kind of do later on in the movie they do yeah no I I found this interesting because I did not know that we kind of pulled a Vietnam here with like dropping fire over civilian villages like that's not something I was aware of fully it was the American military was doing just firebombs on specifically civilian homes. Crazy. Like this was this is how we're gonna win. We're gonna break the war effort by burning children to death. Was essentially it's it's fucking crazy. Real cool guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not you know it's still happening. Yeah, but yeah. I, I mean, I just I I can't think of anything better than to celebrate the death of Henry Kissinger uh, <laughs> because of similar. Similar mindsets with Cambodia and oh, yeah. everything. But, uh, when we cut back to the town, you hear it's scored with a baby crying. Yeah. And with each shot of dead men in the streets, like your your gut reaction is to think, please don't show me what I think you're going to. Right, you know, right. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> the moment later on in the movie, I can't remember what it was juxtaposed with, mm. but somebody's throwing something into a pit mm-hmm. and then it flashes and you see Seta thinking about his mother being thrown into a burn pit it's when oh. it's when she's talking about burying the fireflies yes. she's like yeah, auntie told me that mom's in a grave and, oh my god yeah. oh my god it's i mean there's so many moments throughout this movie where there just are dead people like yeah. they're just dead people at the beach there's dead people in the streets and folks are just stepping, stepping over, over them, them yeah. because they, there's nothing else to do i mean th- that was one of the things that like blew my mind watching Godzilla minus one, right? Oof. Is like all the sequences where everyone's just living in a town that isn't standing anymore, you know? Yeah. A- and that is that is your day to day. I know, Priscilla, when, when I went and saw minus one and I came back and you were just pleasantries, like, how was it? And I'm like, it's fucking devastating. I yeah. was teared up in the theater and you laughed at me. But I, I, think, I think you really should see it. Like, Godzilla is kind of, I mean, as he always is in the best Godzilla movies, he is a metaphor for 
impending doom and just the horror of war america yeah. as an enemy and it's it is a world it's kind of like this it's like what happens after don't the fact. worry i i have enough impending doom <laughs> you carry <laughs> same, girl. No, th- there are weirdly so many parallels between grave of the fireflies and godzilla minus <laughs> one i was i, I was shocked you never thought watching you'd say. it this morning <laughs> yes i know <laughs> No, it's it's an incredible movie. I haven't seen it, and it's it's tough because Toho is their their tradition is not to release physical media or streaming versions of their movies for like a year after they go in theaters. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't if you have a chance to see it in your town right now, please go see Minus One. It is genuinely one of the greatest movies of twenty twenty three. Yeah, it is. No, I, I I can't believe like not knowing parts of you know American history, which mm-hmm. is not surprising that they went and tell you, oh yeah, we firebombed Japanese civilian villages. Oh, yeah, yeah we don't, we don't tend to make movies about. That, we yeah. don't talk about the bad shit we did. Usually. Yeah, I learned a lot about that recently. I went through down like a rabbit hole mm-hmm. of like all the terrible things America has done to mm-hmm. other countries. Yeah. And I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It blew my mind. Yeah. It, it's it's you know we're dealing with this with with Scarlett, who is you know she's about to be eleven years old. Mm-hmm. She's she's in the Florida education system, which should tell you all you need to know. But like, sure, yeah, just asking her like, do you know about you know the Holocaust? Do you oh, know yeah. about September 11th? Do you know about slavery? And yeah. like. She only knows bits and pieces because yeah. that's what they're telling her. And yeah. it's, it's, because m- I've like become a huge history nerd. Sure. So I'm like trying to teach the kids, like, oh, isn't this so cool? Because like I didn't appreciate it when well, I was. Well, not the age. slavery and stuff not like that. that. No. <laughs> but, but not, <laughs> not. I just want to preface that. <laughs> not so much, you know, cool as it is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. In 2021, there was a, a rash of posts on social media from high school students who were just now finding. Finding out that 9-11 was real. Yeah. Like it wasn't just a meme. Yeah. I think I saw that. Like it, it's shocking how l- little history is uh, little by little history is being eroded. Well, it's it's even crazier to think because we were talking about this today, actually, uh, mm-hmm. when we're out to lunch. But like people born right after 9-11 are like old enough to drink now. Mm-hmm. Like that's how that's how far removed we are from it. And, and like, honestly, good for them. They should drink. They this, should. This absolutely. world is terrible. That's that's you know what? I'm having another sake bomb when we're talking about this, but <laughs> No, I mean, not to blow up her spot, but we even, we asked Scarlett, we were like, what, do you know about 9-11 yeah. and, <laughs> and things like that? She goes, yeah, I think it was like the Chinese or something. Oh, no. So, <laughs> oh, Scarlett. So, I was like, oh, we got to get you out of Florida. <laughs> poor poor so baby girl. That's, that's how that is. <laughs> it's so funny how often... When I'm doing like an interview for the comics podcast and we we're talking to someone who's in another part of the country, anytime I say, Well, I live in Florida, there's always like a moment of like, oh, okay. Oh, like I'm everyone sorry. just sort of <laughs> accepts that that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just I I mean not to get too political. Do it. But like that's that's the reality we're living in. Yeah. That's the reality we're living in. You're right though. Like we we see like how difficult it would be for a child to navigate any of this. Mm-hmm. Like Seda's taken to see his mom, who's all wrapped up. The the officer on duty tells him she's finally asleep, yeah. you know, because she's obviously been screaming in pain for hours. Yeah. And meanwhile, like he's a kid. He knows that she needs heart medicine. Yeah. But he can't articulate what kind of medicine she needs, yep. what the, what the regimen is. He's just like, does she have medicine for her heart? Yeah. It's that simple. And you get brief moments of levity, as I mentioned before, sure. but also a brief moment of innocence because I don't remember what they're trying to get, but at some point Setsuko is talking about uh, she wants to get something, she needs money, and she opens up her little her little baby doll purse, oh. and it's just filled with buttons yeah. and coins and everything. Oh and my like, god! This is that's how children think. They're like you know, and Seda like stops for a moment and just kind of smiles and enjoys watching her mm-hmm. trying to take charge. Like it is a sweet. Mo- There's a, the, the the note that I kept writing down is that this is like a sweet kind of desperation, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. there is a. I need you to be comforted, so I'm going to enjoy the moments when we have that. Yeah. Another movie this kept reminding me of, uh, and I, I know people are very split on whether this is a, a masterpiece or a travesty, but Life is Beautiful mm-hmm. kept popping into my brain, mm-hmm. and it, it there are moments here that I that were very reminiscent of that film as well. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, and Saint, though, the, the word I would use to describe him would be uh, patient, yeah. especially for a young boy, yeah. a, a, you know, a teenage boy dealing with all sorts of things, I'm sure. Oh, I would have told my aunt to go fuck herself oh, like immediately dude, dude my other intro alternate was gonna be and fuck the aunt because <laughs> this lady holy shit like the way she turns like on a dime with these kids yeah. it's 
it, it almost becomes like a horror movie. Like I think yeah. it was uh, a sister. It had to be the dad's sister. Right? Yeah, it yeah. Had to be Feels like that, right? Sister in law. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. Like she, they come home to her like scraping the bottom of the food bowl and eating it, eating the food that they brought home and not sharing the food with them. They go to bed hungry with no Dude, blankets. They, there's a moment uh, Priscilla pointed out mm-hmm. whenever they're first eating with the aunt and she's got rice and soup yes. and then she goes to give Seto more and doesn't give him rice, only gives him the soup. It's just broth. Yeah. And then the, her lodger and her daughter have like meat yeah. and like chunky vegetables yeah. in theirs. Like it, there's clearly a difference in consistency. I mean, I wonder if you just have to have some form of on-screen villain in the movie to like propel you through the plot mm-hmm. because <sighs> it's unrealistic to me. <laughs> well, I don't know in some ways, but I, I do think that like there is a there there was a little bit of like a uh, it, it, like, like you're talking about the cultural differences, right? Yeah. Like when in in Godzilla minus one, our hero comes home having decided not to kamikaze himself, and that makes him an outsider. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And these two, uh, this, I mean, uh, Seda is the son of a military official, and he's not helping with the war effort, and yeah. that is seen as an insane <laughs> slight against the country. Well, he's got a great point. Like the ant comes in, and he's like, "Oh, you guys are just doing nothing again today." He's like. Oh, I can't go to school. It burned down. Yeah. I can't go get a job at the at the factory. It burned down. The factory what, exploded. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? And she keeps talking about the privileges they have as military children. She's mm-hmm. like, wow, someone delivered all your stuff for you. And he's like, yeah, we have like three things because yeah. everything burned. Yeah. We have, you know, 7,000 yen and nothing to buy with it because no, no one's using money. And then meanwhile, when they run to the shelter, there's a, you can, he- she's not on screen, but you can hear the aunt in the background congratulating herself mm-hmm. on taking them in. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She was like, I took in these orphans. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what this aunt's fucking problem was, but she had a stick up her ass. I mean, it's supposed to be your family. I would never call a child an orphan to their face. Dude, that is like, wild. She goes, you know, oh, Sato holds back on telling her that his mom's dead and yeah. she's like annoyed that he didn't tell her. he's like well i didn't want to upset oh, setsuko yeah. and she's like well she's you should have like, told us he's just like, what a shame or some shit like and that. setsuko's yeah. already got to live with that fucking haircut i mean she doesn't need any more bad news <laughs> she got the the will buyers from stranger things haircut <laughs> <laughs> oh coconut head haircut i couldn't believe it we talked so I, much shit I, this girl well said. i forgot she looks like uh she looks like sasuke from ponyo yeah like, i i forgot because she doesn't take off her headdress until like you know, 15, 20 minutes into the movie. I'm like, sure. oh, I forgot about this. <laughs> this poor girl. Well, and then Afterlife, uh, Sesko has like that badass red one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She looks great after that. Speaking of badass, after like the fire bombings in general, yeah. um, you know, and Seta and Setsuko are just kind of just waiting around this village that's been burned down. There's a guy that shouts, long live the emperor. Uh-huh. And does he commit Seppuku with the broom handle? Because it looked like it. I think he's just, I think that's just like a shout of defiance no, no I, for I sure but like that bit though the way the animation is he's got like this broom or mop in his hand and he goes to like raise it it could be that he's just lowering his arm to his side but it also looked like he was commanding seppuku and then they cut away from it mm-hmm. i thought it was crazy <laughs> i don't know maybe he was just like standing at attention or something maybe. yeah I, I totally totally missed that yeah maybe I, I don't know i just saw that i was like i had to like ask myself did he just commit here in, <laughs> in front of these kids i mean that'd be wild it would be absolutely wild but it uh, wouldn't be the most upsetting thing in this movie though absolutely I mean, when, you know, Setsuko is like, I want to see mom. He's like, oh, we can't see mom. It's too late now. And Ah, it's like the middle of the day. Right. And like, they're amongst all this rubble. And he just, yeah, like he just tries spinning on this bar to to make her smile. And she just, she just doesn't. And then smash cut to a body covered in maggots. Not to mention that kid, that kid should have been in the Olympics. He was crushing it. That That kid was going. To be real. He was going. I was like, I could never. Yeah. Yeah. Simone Biles, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that's that's sort of like the movie in a microcosm, right? Like, they even have, they go to have a nice day at the beach. There's a corpse on the beach. Ugh. And Seda just says, don't look at that. Yeah. Like, that is that is how he is trying to handle this. He tells her, you know, like you said, she's she's like, I want to go see mom. And he's like, ah, it's late. Maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Like, he's going to keep putting this off as much as he can. Like, he's, he's just trying to keep her innocent for just as long as he can. There, there's other, I'm trying to think there's another movie I'm, that this reminded me of, mm-hmm. of a character, like a sibling trying to shield their younger brother or sister from the horrors around them. And I can't, I'm sure there's a ton, but there's, yeah. there's a specific movie I just could not pinpoint that it reminded me of. Maybe it'll come to me as we go along, but uh, 
Yeah, no, I mean, just the simplicity of a single piece of hard candy being enough to quail, you know, this this crying four year old. Yeah. Like, it's an innocent movie. It's mm-hmm. it's sad that like that's you know, there's nothing to do. They're like, well, let's just go to the beach. Let's just play this piano. Thank God we still got a piano we can play. Right. Let's just enjoy this fruit candy. And if the fruit candy runs out, we'll fill up the tin with water and the, the remnants of scraps. You can still taste it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, it's a beautiful movie. Right. Like, it, it really is. Like, just if for as much devastation that's happening, an entire country under siege, basically, like, to have these kids find these little moments. And, of course, the, the namesake of the movie, finding the fireflies and, and playing with them. Yeah. And Sato just trying to show her, like, oh, you can't squeeze too hardly because you'll kill it. Right. <laughs> She's like, oh, I've got to rub it on her pants uh-huh. Oh my god, I want to point something out. And she was like, it stinks. Yeah. So I was I was trying to talk to <laughs> Dustin about this the other day. And I was like, I can bugs stink. You can smell bugs. Dustin can't smell bugs. No, oh, no. Yeah, some people can smell cockroaches, right? Well, Isn't that a thing? Well, well, she said to me, she goes, Don't bugs stink? And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and she's like, Yeah, you know, bugs smell bad. I'm like, are, are you are you okay? <laughs> like, and then we watching this movie, and then you know, and sets, I was like, look, and I'm like, yeah, but that makes sense because she killed a bug and then wiped it on her pants. Right. Like, yeah, I would get that stinks, but you're like, no, bugs just smell bad all the time. They do, you can smell them. <laughs> well, I also don't have the cilantro gene, so they sting. I cannot, but also my my nose is permanently fucked up, so. <laughs> Oh, they yeah. definitely have it. I, I skipped over this because I don't know, but I thought I would mention. I was very sad that I saw a cat running for its life. <laughs> oh my gosh! An animated cat. Yeah, yeah in the I, first firebomb, that yeah, cat's hauling ass. And I was like, "How dare they? They left this poor cat." Yeah. That's I mean, what are you going to do with a cat in, in wartime? You can't even put feed it yourself. Put it in a fucking pillowcase. And then do what? Beat it to death? Just put it out of its misery? You can't Jesus. feed it. <laughs> <laughs> Take it with you. Maybe they eat it. That, well, I guess you could. I mean, when times, when times are tough. Times get tough. <laughs> Save the cat, but also eat the cat. That's the second part of that book that no one reads. <laughs> <laughs> I watched this documentary about this commune, and they said they, they ate cats when they got desperate. Are we talking about the, the one that we the watched? On? Oh, my God. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck the garden. <laughs> Fuck that. What's the, that kid's name? Leaf. What the fuck was his name? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch the show. It's annoying. Okay. I fucking hated that guy. <laughs> anyway, seeing when Setsuko takes her her clothes off at the beach for the first time, and you yeah. see that she is just covered in burns. Yeah, the sores and oh, the yeah. I just I I mean, and she talks about when, when the, during the firebombing was that her eyes are burning too, yeah. and I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, I can't, I couldn't imagine. Like, and you're getting the first inkling around here that Seta is also wearing down. Like he's trying to put on a brave face all the time, but like. Like when the second air raid happens, yeah, and she's just like, "I'm too tired to run," yeah. and he looks reluctant to like pick her up because yeah. he's like, I, "I like he's running out of energy." Yeah, and then having to trade his mother's kimono is just for food. <sighs> Your mother won't need her kimono anymore. Yeah. Fuck all the way off, dude. And then when like he gets rice for it and he brings it back, yeah. and then she rations out. She takes half of it, and I love his little like defeated like that's our rice. Yeah. and she goes, "How dare you?" Yeah, I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> she complains that they're not sharing their own rice. That she said this is yours. Like it's all. Yeah, she's. You're right. She's a monster person. <laughs> I wanted that woman to get sepsis halfway through the movie and just see her <laughs> lifeless and, and like. In a bathtub or so. I don't know. I, I wanted the worst for this character. She, she, she is like, why don't you get a job? Why don't you have kid? good manners? <laughs> what the fuck's he supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, it was like the 40s. Didn't they get married at like 12? I, you, maybe. I don't fucking know. But just. I mean, she's still a raging bitch. Totally. But, yeah. Yeah. I do love this moment when they finally have like a little bit of independence. They get, they, they're making rice in their own room. Mm-hmm. And, and she's mad about it. Well, and then he like <laughs> lays down after he finishes eating and Setsuko goes like, that's bad manners. And he goes, you can relax. Yeah. And she just kind of shifts one foot yeah. out from underneath. <laughs> her. So like, she's like, I'm not totally there yet. Yeah. It's really, really sweet. And then you hear her gossiping with her husband or whatever. She's like, they bought their own stove just to spite me. I'm like, you told them they had to make their own food. Right. What are you talking about? And, like, and the aunt is like, they have the piano that's there. They're having fun. And the aunt is just like, you're fucking useless. Go live in a cave. Like, <laughs> and to their credit, they fucking do. They like, do. The, the last half of this movie, them decided we're going to be independent. We're going to live out every kid's dream of like living on our own even under the worst circumstances and the fact that they they make do like yeah yeah, he's got to steal and he's got to do what he's got to do but like this kid he he puts in work yeah you can't say he didn't do it so and i love the detail that he doesn't even look at his aunt while they're saying goodbye good like you can feel her trying to figure 
out if this is her fault. Like she still isn't totally accepting it. Yeah. And he's just like not gonna look at her. Yeah, she she she's like surprised that they want to move out. It's yeah. like, I don't know. You, you keep poking somebody with a stick and then they finally fight back. What do you expect? And in the previous scene, she's like, Don't you have other family you can live with? <laughs> I know. Like and he's like, I don't know their address. Yeah. I don't even know if their house still exists. Lady, I just got my first armpit hair. What the fuck do you want me to do? <laughs> same. <laughs> same. Same. <laughs> And then, yeah, I just wrote down that Sato's fucking spirit is way better than mine mm-hmm. because the second, if I'm a 12, 13 year old boy and I got to take care of my four year old sister, right? I don't know where my dad is. My mom is dead. I have, the dad's definitely dead. Oh, he's yeah. definitely dead by that point, probably. But having money and not being able to buy anything, having no one take care of you and you were just thrust on your own and you're like, I'm going to move into this old shelter by the lake. Uh-huh. And he's like, we're going to rig up a tire swing and we, you know, we'll, we'll make, we'll make our own beds. I'm like, he, I don't know. I would have gave up a lot sooner than this no he's amazing he's and and you know it's even more effective when you know that this is based on you know a true story yeah. and, and a lot of true stories yeah and uh at this scene the shot where they open up the pot full of fireflies yeah and setsuko's eyes light up that shot will stick with me forever it's great it is the it's the most memorable moment in the movie for me yeah and i found one of the hardest scenes to watch before we get to the actual end mm-hmm. is when setsuko is is digging in the dirt mm-hmm. and she's making a, you know she's she's playing around and say to us what are you doing she goes oh i'm making a grave he's like why are you making a grave he's like, well mommy's in a grave now so i thought i'd make one yeah she says that the aunt told her that her mother was dead and that if that was me if i was sato i would have walked back over to that aunt's house and told her to square up right. because there's no reason it's out of spite that she does that setsuko didn't even know what a grave was yeah so she had no concept of a grave until now and it, it is it's another reminder that these children had to grow up way too fucking fast way like there's fast. no there's no reason for her to even have a concept of death yet yeah She's still basically in diapers, yeah. I mean, more or less, so. I don't know how he didn't know that the aunt told her. Like, how, you know, wasn't she upset at that time to show? Maybe he was gone getting supplies when that happened, yeah. I don't know. But she she held it in for quite a while. I know, she was very casual about it. Yeah. And then, you know, Sato doing what he has to do and trading what he can for groceries and then finally... Stealing. Yeah, resorting to stealing when he can't do anything. I would have stole from day one. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, fucking lootly. Like, I'm sorry. That <laughs> moment where they steal their first tomato, like, he just chomps down on that tomato and yeah. then hands one to her and she says, is this okay? Yeah. Like, she, she still is, like, trusting him to do the right thing. Yeah. And he's like, don't worry about it, just fucking eat. <laughs> right. Ugh. And then, yeah, he gets caught by the farmer at night, and the farmer beats him up to a pulp and drags him to the police station. And this police officer, who does the one right thing for these kids his entire movie, yeah. is just like, you know, he threatens the farmer. He's like, I don't know, this looks like child abuse to me. Yeah, he looks like you beat the shit out of a little kid who yeah. is struggling to survive already. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, it just... Everyone's like, is it there somewhere you can go? This guy grabs Seda and like drags him away while Setsuko is like crying. I know. So he like knowingly abandons this toddler, essentially. Like and the cop, yeah, the cop is just like all over his ass. Yeah, and I mean thank God Setsuko actually followed him and yeah. was able to, you know, catch up and make sure that you know, she caught up with him, but like her seeing her older brother just beaten to a pulp and like crying. Mm-hmm. It's he's he's the last bastion of support that she has yeah. of you know toughness, and to see him in this you know vulnerable moment, it's it's heavy, and it doesn't get any better from here. No, so. <laughs> Buckle up. Yeah. Everyone just thought this whole movie is just telling these kids just, isn't there somewhere you can go? Isn't there someone you can, you know, get help from? Right. And to know that these kids are not, this is not an isolated incident to know that these kids are just one of many, right. you know, pairs that are probably dealing with this around the country. Yeah. A full, fully a lost generation. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're one of thousands, you know, millions maybe. And I thank him for all that he's done for cinema and I value his judgment and his criticism on everything, but <laughs> I have to disagree with Spike Lee. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> he said that his one criticism of Oppenheimer was they didn't show Japan after the bombings. Mm. And he's just one of many people that say that, but like... Yeah, we, we've talked about this, like that's a different story. And not only that, but that's not the point of the story. Right. Right? And I think if you want that, there are so many movies, especially from the Japanese perspective. Yes. Of 
what that was like. And there's a, a anime that I keep meaning to watch that I haven't seen yet. But have you seen Barefoot Jin? I have not. I, I don't know about this one. It's another Japanese anime. I believe it was also made, you know, uh, like fairly late, like 80s, 90s. I could be wrong about that. But I've seen a scene from it and I'm like, holy fucking shit, I uh-huh. have to see this movie. But it is from the instance the bombs drop the perspective. Like you see, imagine the scene from Terminator 2, the dream sequence. Imagine that, but for real. Oh my and God. in anime. Like that is what that is. So there, if you want to see from the Japanese perspective, of what happened during the bombings there are you can seek out that art yes exactly yeah and i think this kind of would be a good pairing with oppenheimer Uh honestly like if you watch oppenheimer first and then watch this and you can kind of get you know because oppenheimer is all heady machismo kind of you know just men in suits and rooms arguing about things and then this you can get not only a different medium with anime but you can also get a different perspective with the japanese and also a different perspective in terms of ages because you're then you're dealing with children right and like i said i couldn't believe that of all the well-respected filmmakers as Spike Lee of all people would say that right. like, you should understand this more than anyone absolutely <laughs> yeah by the way if anybody is interested there is a Japanese version of this podcast yeah uh, and uh-huh. it's, <laughs> it's way it's better very different it's way better <laughs> it's actually it's so much it's so much more artful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then yeah like Sato's resorted to stealing as much as he can to provide for him and his sister and mm-hmm. this air raid scene here towards the end where everyone is fleeing from this village and Sato is the only one running into it mm-hmm. so he, he can use this opportunity to go into people's to homes to steal yeah, clothing and, and food yeah. and he's trying to trade stolen robes and there there is a moment where he comes up over the hill with all the robes under his clothes like mm-hmm. he's looking and it's it is darkly funny because he's so proud of himself but also like you know that he's rail thin mm-hmm. under there yeah. and it's it's just this weird juxtaposition of of how how frail he actually feels versus how like fat and happy he looks in that moment yeah he's Carl Havoc though he's got too much it's fucking great, shit on he's got too much fucking shit <laughs> well he you know I, I saw I saw fat Seta and I was like it's nice to see myself on screen <laughs> like, <laughs> nice to see myself represented in cinema but he he also seems like he's fully losing it like he's cackling and laughing and like it's it's like this adrenaline rush that he's getting it's the first time you've seen him seeming to enjoy himself truly in a while yeah he laughs yeah he laughs when all the clothes fall out from under his his, his coat right yeah. and at this point Setsuko is dying. Mm-hmm. She says, I've been having diarrhea a lot lately. She's mm-hmm. been destroyed by mosquitoes. The moment that like really haunts me is when she's just sitting there by the lake and says, something is wrong with my tummy. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. It ugh, breaks my heart. He He's trying to feed her and he says, if you don't eat, dad will blame me for it. <sighs> like that's, yeah. that's the, the mindset that Seita has throughout this whole movie. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just thinking, kid, your dad is probably dead. Right. Like, yeah. And to know that like he is carrying on, he, he takes the mantle of man of the house immediately and with such seriousness. Like, yeah. He doesn't have a moment really to himself to enjoy playing. Like maybe the scene at the beach is the only time where he's doing cartwheels. But he's also, he's so caught up in caring for her that he has fully missed the fact that the war has ended yeah you know like he there the, it, all of that goes past him we have that moment where he takes her to the doctor and the doctor just very casually and dismissively is like yeah get her some food yeah. he's like how the fuck am i supposed to get food yeah like i'm a child on my own <laughs> that that doctor being like oh this, that's all this kid needs is some food like and then the next place just coming right in and like just ignoring these children like, yeah i I, I don't know, man. Well, and because, again, he was one of a million people that were, you know, cycling in and out of that doctor's office for months, yeah. years, you know, like, he, he, what what are you going to do when you have nothing? I just, I, I could not, I mean, we've been fortunate enough that, like, September 11th is, like, the closest thing we've had to, like, a wartime feeling on American soil, right. and, like, I wasn't affected by it at all. Mm. So, like, to know that, like, so much could happen so quickly and for things to go wrong so quickly, right. it's... I don't know. It's it is an unfortunately it is like an everlasting fear that I have to live through now because of just the way things have gone the past couple of years yeah. and to know that like it's not probably going to get any better anytime soon. Nope. Just not optimistic. <laughs> and we're in 2024 in election year. So I've g- I got to go through the whole rick and roll again. Boy, I, uh, I, when I tell you that I, I'm going to be in a low level panic attack <laughs> for most of this year until like Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And man, when there's this other fire bombing and we cut to this wide shot mm-hmm. and just these fire canisters raining down over the city Ugh. and it match cuts to the fireflies in the in the field. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's fucking it's gorgeous. It's great juxtaposition. The storytelling that tells you everything you need to know in two shots. Yep. Of this whole movie. Yeah. And then yeah, you'd see Setsuko, just her ribs exposed uh, from malnourishment, and you can see her energy is depleting rapidly. She's I mean, Seto comes back and finds her just lost lying in the grass and thinks she's dead. There is a single fly on her face. Yes. As there was with his mom earlier. Yes. And it doesn't, they don't have to flash back to that to tell us exactly what he's thinking. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, at this point, he's like, well, maybe I can go get some money now. Maybe people will start trading with money again. And to know that you have all this money. And then that's when you find out, oh, the war is over. We lost. Yeah. He takes out all their savings and can't fucking pay for anything because now people are like, what am I, where am I going to spend money? All the stores have exploded, you know? Yeah. Money is useless at this point. (laughs) Don't you know? It's all about bottle caps, kid. (laughs) Right. That's what he tried to. uh, Welcome to Lamplighter. (laughs) With that, the guy, the gardener. Oh, yeah. Or whatever. And then he didn't have anything to, to barter with him. And then he's stealing kimonos and saying that they're, they're his mother's and people aren't buying it. Is that the gardener who tells him, why don't you just swallow your pride and, and apologize yes. to your aunt? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, why don't you kick rocks, old man? <laughs> I mean, it, he's got the best advice you're going to get in that moment. That's true. But it's not it's not good to hear. And I don't I, I don't blame Seto. I wouldn't have gone back either. Right. I would have. I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't put Seto to go through it. As my, like, I could go back and swallow my pride, but I couldn't subject Seto to go to that. Mm-hmm. It's the opposite. I would have just gave her to the, her. I mean, like, uh, take this child because I can't care for her. Mm. You would have dealt with, like, a Cinderella thing though. Like, uh, she's going to be scrubbing the floors in a couple years. That's fine. She's alive. <laughs> I keep going back and forth on whether he did the right thing. Yeah. 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 I, I just... I mean, it must seem so hopeless. I mean, the, he, he finds out the war's over and that the fleets were depleted. And so he just walks back to the cave saying to himself over and over again, now even dad's dead. Yeah. Now even dad's dead. Well, he even asked that guy that tells him the war's over. He goes, is my dad alive? And like, that's, you know, the way children think. It's like, how would I know? Right. I don't know you. I don't know your dad. Exactly. Yeah. He's like, you're a weird kid. And he's like, no, I'm a, I'm a child. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to reason with this unreasonable thing. Yeah. And yeah, him him coming back and having food now, having yeah. pumpkin and watermelon and all this stuff and trying to feed Setsuko. Just like a day or two too late. Just, just yeah. slightly too late. He says, it's watermelon. I didn't steal this either. Yeah. Like he, he's, all, he's still trying to reassure her. And her on her deathbed Ugh. taking rocks and saying, I made you these rice balls. Like, she just wants to play. Ugh. She's trying to play and trying to help. And just Ugh. his VO of she never woke up. Mm. I think that's oh, the best. Oh my God. Oh my God. It, Fucking, it destroyed me the first time, it destroyed me the second time. Like, that me. I think that was, like, one of the more peaceful ways to have gone. I mean, I if agree. she went to the shelter with the mom, she would have got burned alive, too, and lived. I mean, they do life. go to the shelter briefly. No, and, in the beginning. Yeah, no, I know. But she, she even says, like, when they go later on, and she's like, I hate it here, it's too hot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, malnourishment is no fucking fun way to go out, for sure. But it's it has become so commonplace that, like, when he goes to buy charcoal so that he can burn her body, mm-hmm. the guy who sells it to him is so casual and light. Yeah. Like, he he literally describes, he's like, okay, well, this is how you do it. This is how hot it needs to be. Yeah. Ah, the weather's fine today, isn't it? Like, yeah. it's truly so casual because that is how awful everything is all the time. Yeah. And we talked about this earlier, we hinted at it, but like the great little button on this is oh my god he's there in in the shelter yeah. he's 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 gonna leave like he's burned his sister's body to ash and bone and put it in this fruit candy tin and then across the lake wealthy people return home <laughs> these rich family and all these little girls come back and they're like oh our house was untouched it's so nice to be back home nothing has changed nope. they announced yep it's devastating we can listen to the gramophone look at that view oh, oh isn't it so pretty and literally we pan from their balcony to the mine where they've been staying. Yep. Ugh, it, it is so infuriating yeah. and heartbreaking. And then, like, we we get a great moment here because the, throughout the movie, this, this is the end of the film, throughout the movie, uh, the afterlife versions of Seto and Setsuko have been watching along, like, mm-hmm. riding the train when they ride the train and watching them at the lake. That's one of my favorite moments mm-hmm. in the whole movie is when he's she's asleep in his lap, he's holding their mom's ashes Mm -hmm. the camera pans over and we see the firefly versions of them sitting on the train also like uh, it's 
it's incredible. And speaking of that, there's a great moment here too, where, you know, the afterlife versions of themselves are sitting there looking out over the city. This mm-hmm. is after Setuko's died and seemingly Seto is, is dying in the train station. Yeah. And there's a brief moment that I noticed this time mm. where Seto breaks the fourth wall and looks right down the barrel yes. at the viewer. Yeah. It's kind of haunting, honestly. Like He I, hugs her, then looks right at us mm-hmm. and then looks back at the city. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's pretty much it. I mean, we know how it, what happens because we saw the beginning of the movie, yeah. but Sato dies in the train station and the whole family's gone. Oof. So, yeah, fun movie. <laughs> Grave of the Fireflies. <laughs> Do you have any uh, any notes that we missed? Priscilla, any, any final thoughts? Anything we missed? Someone should have kicked that ant's ass. <laughs> yeah. That's, that would have been a great post credit scene. That woman just getting her ass beat by fireflies. They become like, like a mech suit. That's good. <laughs> No, it's just sad, and I also just feel like just also a reminder that a lot of war is pointless. Yeah, yeah, almost all of it for it, the most part. I mean, who who actually gets hurt in these wars? Usually, innocent people. War. What is it good for? <laughs> I mean, we're absolutely nothing. We're dealing with that still yeah. with Israel and Palestine. I and, um, I'm, I'm going to pull a quote. There's one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite comedians, but Bill Burr has said it best, which is, "How is war legal? Why are there why are there rules <laughs> yeah. for war? Right? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Yeah. I just feel like it'd be better if like everyone just minded their own business. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. Just keep to yourself. Yeah. That's all. Can you imagine Bernie Sanders just saying that? (laughs) (laughs) Everyone should just mind their own business. Yeah. But yeah, that is, that's Grave of the Fireflies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go ahead and talk about it now. Recommendations. I do. (sighs) I think it's an incredible piece of art in in a microcosm. Yeah. Right? Like, this is one of many stories of post-World War II Japan and in current uh, Japan, like, when it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's simplistic, I would say, is a great way to describe this movie. It's very simplistic, but complex in terms of the characters Mm -hmm. and how they feel and how they deal with the ramifications of something that they are not a part of like the the innocent bystanders and all of this and you know no no one is not hurt right in a conflict someone is always injured someone's always the the brunt end of it you know rightfully or wrongfully so but i think the, the animation is great yeah like one of my reasons i don't watch a lot of current anime is because i don't like how smooth animations have become i like that rigidness right same reason i don't care for 3d disney and pixar movies i like the old school stuff no, you miss the hand-drawn the scrappy kind of feel i can yeah. feel the the love in the admiration and yeah. the talent and the creativity and something like snowflake oh, snowflake <laughs> The that's that's that's, that's the that's the right wing version of that's it. But Snow White. Um, I was I was thinking I was thinking Snowflake of the scene in the Seven Cups. <laughs> I was in my head. I was thinking of that scene in uh, I think it's Cinderella where they're dancing in front of the lake. Yeah. And I was oh, Snow totally. White at the same time. So the, uh, and this is love sequence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Peter yeah. Pan. Uh, like one of my favorite Disney movies is Hundred One Dalmatians because mm-hmm. I admire the the animation style. <laughs> If if it was if it was made today, it'd be a hundred and one Dalvations. Am I right? <laughs> do I? What do I do here? Do I do? I'll, I'll do both. <laughs> this is what we call a boo cheer. <laughs> it just just uh, just to reiterate for the listener, I promise that's not the kind of thing that I do actually think is funny. I don't believe what I just said. <laughs> No, I, I think the animation is beautiful. A lot of this, the the imagery here is it feels like watercolor that's been brought to life yes, a lot of yeah. times. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's great. So do you recommend Grave of the Fireflies? If you feel like watching a really if fucking you, sad movie, if you, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably, I don't know. I think people should mentally be prepared to go into this movie. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, big thing for me, I hate fucking watching movies where kids die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Mm. That was why Ashley noped out of this one too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This might be Mally's favorite movie, actually, now that I think of it. Is that truly, what he said? No, he just likes kids dying in movies. So oh. <laughs> He's so edgy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, Nathan, recommendations? Uh, yeah, I I would recommend seeing this one. Like Priscilla said, major caveats. You know, if if you just know what you're in for, know what you're going into. It, but it is such a an utterly human story that is told in such a beautiful uh, way without without a ton of frills too. Like yeah. there's not. There's not a whole lot of like artistic license taken with history here. We are just we are here for this story, and it's it's so perfectly told. Uh, it's absolutely devastating. It's one that I think, uh, but I think you should watch it at least once, yeah, and then maybe not again yeah. <laughs> if it really like hurt you, you know. Yeah, 
No, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's very few movies that, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I can't watch Requiem for a Dream more than once. I saw it once. I'm good. Uh, there's very few movies that I feel that way about. Right. I could definitely watch Grave of the Fireflies again. Yeah. I would put something like Salo in that list of movies I never want to see again. Oh, yeah, um, movies that are utterly reprehensible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I could definitely watch this again. I think you should put a time period. So I can only watch this movie. One- every, ten, every decade? Yeah. Yeah, like once every five, ten years. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, because I need to be reminded of how terrible and sad it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, not terrible, but... Terrible for the characters. Terrible emotionally. Yeah. Right. No, I, I think that's a good idea, yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. I gotta say, a couple of years ago, during uh, during Ghibli Fest, when, you know, when they screen the movies uh, on the on the big screen, they do a, you know, rotating selection, and mm-hmm. a few years ago, they played this film on the anniversary of the Hiroshima bombings. Oh, oh my God. Like, well, that's dark. I was yeah. like, can you fucking imagine, like, I'm gonna settle in and sit and watch this. Get the popcorn, like, kids. Bring uh, the blankets. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> oh, my God. And then next week, Porco Rosso. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we jump over to a segment that I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun with, and we can talk about Prop Cop. Ba-na-na-na. And if you're new to the show, if you're just finding us for the first time, I guess we didn't really lay out what the show is. Oh, yeah. What is this? <laughs> as you can tell, uh, this is a show where we watch movies that are depressing as fuck by the time the credits start rolling. Mm-hmm. We're left on cliffhangers or things like that, and we try to find the good in those things, the silver lining, hence the name of the show. And Prop Cop is a segment where we look at all of the tangible items in the movie we talked about this week. In this case, of course, Grave of the Fireflies. And we try to find one prop that we would love to own for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Obviously, this is an animated movie, so none of this stuff is real anyway but we can like we can imagine nathan what would your animated self like to own from this movie so they have a little rice bowl set Mm -hmm. with like these little blue flower accents on them i thought those were precious and i would absolutely use them daily okay so uh, you don't have to have one but is there a prop from this movie that you think would be cool to own in real life the ant (laughs) soul So you can keep it in the tin and I, never let it go. I put it in a little <laughs> jar and kick it every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought about getting the the Sakume drop tin just because mm-hmm. it seems like the the thing from this movie. Totally. Um, but I to go with along with what you said, Nathan, I kind of wanted his little portable rice cooker. I oh, think yeah. it's always good to have a rice cooker in the house. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we have one. I was like, we have a. Rice I would like cooker. an authentic Japanese, you know, like one of those 1940s little stoves. Yeah. One. yeah, yeah, a little stove that we can just take with us and cook rice with any time we want it. Where are you going? Nowhere, but you never know. I mean, our house could get rice hit with town. a fireball. <laughs> 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 We're rolling out to Rice Town. <laughs> Well, what about bit part? There is a couple of uh, no-named extra little characters in this movie. It would mm. be nice for us to have our voices in this movie. Who, what's the character that you'd like to voice, Nathan? Priscilla already mentioned it earlier, but I want to be the cat that's oh, hauling that's ass during the said. first raid. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be the guy that does shout, long live the emperor, and then maybe commit seppuku with maybe the broom. Maybe kills himself with know. a broom. <laughs> there is a lot of like, because I watched, I actually watched the English dub this time um, for my watch. Pretty I, good I, dub. It's it's not bad. Yeah. But there are little asides that people say, like in the train station in the village and stuff, that were kind of kind of funny out of pocket. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but is there another one you could think of, Priscilla, maybe? Maybe you could be one of those those girls that come in at the very end. They're like, oh, our house is totally fine. Yeah, my record collection. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the jar of pickled plums. <laughs> you want to be the jar? You want to be the foley work of the jar being yes. open? <laughs> be the jar. <laughs> I think that's twice now we've had a guest on the show that has picked a non speaking inanimate object as their bit part. <laughs> really? Yeah, Hauser picked being the pole in Matrix Reload. <laughs> <laughs> I think he got a bit part and prop caught backwards, but... I forgot that. <laughs> I, I forgot just want to be like, I want them to edit me just like being a jar. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here comes, you know, the, the, here comes the boom. The slam. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about our silver linings for Grave of the Fireflies. And uh, I got to be honest, I didn't write one down because I I got to think about it. Yeah. I, I still, I watched this movie days ago and I still haven't thought of one. I have one. Okay, go ahead. So at the end when they're, when they're in the afterlife and they're staring at the city, it looks like the rebuild is on the way, right? Like yeah, the war yeah. has ended, rebuilding has begun. Yeah. Not gr- a great silver lining for our characters, but for the world at large, maybe. I find it interesting now that I'm thinking about it, mm. that only Setsuko and Seita are there in the the afterlife like mm. we don't see the mom we don't see the dad yeah i found i don't know i'm Maybe not they went to hell oh my god <laughs> 
What, what, a, what a twist that would be. That's a sequel. Yeah. Hell of the Fireflies. <laughs> so you don't have to have one, but is oh, there... Oh, I'm already ready. Oh, please, please. I got a couple for you. Oh, 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 wow. Okay, go ahead. I mean, they're not good for our characters, except one. But I would say that they died fairly peacefully. I want to say that's... A, that's uh, a, I mean, it could have got blown up or... Yeah. Am I wrong to want to... I would rather have gotten blown up yeah, than... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I, of all the ways I could think to die, starving to death feels awful. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I feel I mean, that. They starve to death, like, slightly until death because they it, did eat some stuff. Fair, fair enough. It wasn't enough. like they didn't eat for days. They just weren't eating enough to actually, like, live. And okay. What's these other silver linings you got? Well, first off, that ant got some free food. That's true. <laughs> Good for her. I guess if you st- if you take food from a child, yes, you technically I mean, got free food. She stole their food, like clearly. Sure, <laughs> she sure. got free food. I also want to say that those like girls that came in the end, they didn't experience any war. Yeah, no, they, that's they, they uh, seem to have a good time. All all this is is perfectly adequate for a silver lining, definitely. I, I think when I when I stand back and actually observe this movie for what it is and what it's doing, what it's saying, and what the ending actually is, mm-hmm. the silver lining for me it's not a it's not a fancy one, but I do say that Seta and Satsuko are together again, yeah, and invincible. Like they don't have to worry about eating, they don't have to worry about surviving. They I just the suffering's been, over. That yeah. been like the yeah. obvious one. I'm yeah. Just- no, I mean, I just what I'm thinking about now. Like I. Yeah, it sucks. Two kids are fucking dead right. for no fault of their own. But like to think to know that like now they can just play with the fireflies. Right. Yeah. And, and what a great title. An unbelievable title. Oh, yeah. I just, I don't know, man. We've talked about this before, but like the art of just titling your movie or your TV show yeah. is, is gone seemingly. The old man. <laughs> that was the one that made you mad, right? The old man, evil, evil. on CBS evil, or right. whatever. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay, well, I think that's really it. The only other thing we can do is provide our pick-me-ups, yeah. our alternatives, movies you can watch. If Grave of the Firefly just leaves you feeling fucking dour and upset by the end of it, what's a movie you can watch after the fact to, you know, balance things out, make you feel a little bit better? I'm going to go with another World War II movie from a different perspective, but mm-hmm. one that is also of innocent people caught in the crossfire, and I'm going to go with Jojo Rabbit. Oh, yeah. Nice. I think maybe Taika Waititi's last good movie he'll ever make. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> quite possibly. It sure, sure seems to be pointing that way, right? And a movie where uh, a kid is left to defend for themselves after their mom dies. Oh, yeah. Man, the shot of the shoes dangling. Oh, my God. I was just thinking about it. Yeah. It popped into my head. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I really like Jojo Rabbit. I It's a shame Taika Waititi has kind of plundered his name. Yeah. But uh, every time someone mentions him now, all I think about is that clip from like the free guy behind the scenes that went oh viral where Sean, Sean Levy's just like, he's like riffing on a whole other level. I put that movie on as a joke when I was like, let's, find, <laughs> let's try and watch this movie. We got about 12 minutes in. I was like, can't fucking do it. No, can't I, do it. I haven't. I have not seen it. I, I don't know. Directors that can also act is far and few between. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Taika Waititi, I don't know if he can do it. But uh, yeah, he's great as Hitler is a sentence that no one's ever said. But <laughs> what a good sentence. Yeah, I like Jojo Rabbit. Mm-hmm. Nathan, what do you think? What's a movie people should watch? I'm still sort of uh, digesting this movie, but I watched uh, Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron yeah. last night, uh, also known as How Do You Live? And it has a lot of parallels with this film. It actually begins with a with a firebombing and, uh, and, and, and it takes place in a very similar uh, well in the same era sort of drawing from Miyazaki's childhood experiences mm-hmm. and sort of almost feels like a culmination of the 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 Ghibli brand there there's so many like sort of visual callbacks to a, a whole career of work it, it's uh, it's a really fascinating gorgeously animated movie that I'm still trying to figure out how it made me feel <laughs> yeah no, I, I can't wait to see it I think it'd be a hell of a double feature okay so, can you think of a movie people should watch that's a good pairing after they watch Grave of the Fireflies? I don't watch happy movies. <laughs> oh, no. Well, there you go. No. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't really have one that would pair well with this, but I think okay. every time I come on this podcast, I recommend Harry and the Henderson. <laughs> 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 your 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 film taste is an enigma to me. And oh, man. I'm definitely like I need a good movie that pairs with this. I'm like, please recommend <laughs> Harry and the Henderson. It's so funny. <laughs> I just I I don't know what to do with you. I don't know what to do with you. I don't know your film. Your your taste in film is so. I, there's no pattern and there's no pattern to I it like whatsoever. It when I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that is The Grave of the Fireflies. If you want more of the Silver Linings playlist, you can get more in our back catalog and uh, the next coming Mondays for the next few weeks uh, until we wrap up Season 7. But uh, we, we're available anywhere you get podcasts. 
Uh, wherever you're listening right now, please rate, get some feedback, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. If you want to follow us on social media, you can on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search for the Seven Linings playlist, or you can go over to reddit.com slash r slash Seven Linings playlist as well. Should we should we make uh, the announcement uh, that we want to make, or should we wait? What do you think? About Mally's diarrhea? About Mally's diarrhea. Yeah, he's dead. Oh, I no. Oh, my God. <laughs> this movie. This movie killed him. Okay. Um. No, what do, you, what do you think? Should we- Go for it. Should we do it? Sure. So- Persona and I have been talking about this for a while that um, I, I think she sees what this podcast has done and she's like, please, I see what you've done for others. Do it for me too. Sure. But, uh, I want to be TikTok famous. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have people arguing about what is and isn't AI uh, on TikTok, you fucking nerds. I want to I have people weighing in on eight hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but we've talked about uh, doing a show together for quite some time now mm-hmm. and we just can never figure out what that show is going to be. But uh, we finally finally had an idea we finally came up with an idea so we haven't recorded our first episode yet but we have started developing it in the show i'll go ahead and tell you the title the show is called we must be missing something <laughs> and the premise of the show is that uh, persona and i often are like-minded in things we don't like i would say more than things we do like does that is that fair to say like we both dislike the same things more than oftentimes than not that we like the same thing yes that's correct yeah So, there's a lot of things that we just don't get. We don't get the appeal of. We don't understand why it's so popular, why it's so beloved. Some topics that we've talked about, Mm -hmm. I don't know when we'll record these episodes, but uh, for example... um, Car modification culture, like jacked up trucks <laughs> and Honda Civics with loud mufflers. We don't get it. I just want to know what joy does this bring you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Taylor Swift's music. What makes you dance in a fucking movie theater? Yeah, yeah. I don't get it. So we're not just going to get on this show and just shit talk these things. Sure. We genuinely like want to understand yeah. what brings you joy in these subjects. So we're going to do objective deep dives into these things, figure out why people like it, how it came to be so popular, Mm. you know, interview people that like those things and see what they think about it. And then at the end of each episode, I think what we'd like to do is say, uh, does our judgment still stand? Do we still not like this thing? Do we get it? Because we're clearly missing something Mm -hmm. because these things are popular. I don't think we're going to like it. Probably not. I mean, what a twist. Yeah, we might. But I think the important part is we, we do our due diligence to try and understand. Maybe you'll put a fart box on their SUV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe we'll make our, we'll low ride our SUV somehow. We'll lower it, put some rims on it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's the show. Um, I don't know when we're going to release our first episode. But, Sometime uh, this year. Yeah, definitely be 2024 at some point. Uh, so look out for that. I'll, I'll uh, try and promote it more whenever the first episode does drop. So look out for that. Again, that's called We Must Be Missing Something. I can't wait. Dustin sent me the pitch for the show a few <laughs> days ago, and I was like, hell yes, this is such a... And, it, and it, like one of the things that I think is so... Like you, you said, I think one of the things that's so exciting about the premise is that it's not inherently you shit-talking anything. No. You're truly... like It's not coming from a bad faith perspective. You yeah. want to figure it out. I want to understand. I want to see what I'm missing. Mm-hmm. I've got to be missing something, so what am I missing? Yeah, I mean, like millions of people. I mean, maybe even more like like some of this stuff mm-hmm. yeah yeah there's old entire cultures that we don't understand that we want to try and understand like i don't understand the people that make smoking weed their entire personality i don't sure. get it i need to i want to know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's just some of the ideas we're, we're thinking of but we we pitched this idea I, I i pitched this idea to priscilla and then we sat there for like hours just like oh what this will be a great episode we gotta do what on this thing this thing so i mean you you truly have a list that could fill up three years worth uh-huh. of episodes it's <laughs> kind of wild <laughs> like listen i don't understand a lot yeah Yeah. so yeah be on the lookout for that awesome okay well i think that's everything i want to say i guess we could say that mally did send in some notes about uh grave of the fireflies uh his thoughts on it um that i can read off here and also i can give you his clue for what we're going to be talking about next week here in a moment but Mm -hmm. he did say that um this was his first time watching the movie with no knowledge of what the movie was about right and uh yeah he was just like oof um not not great he does have some other notes. He says, "If you, I don't understand this. If you take out the cannibalism, this is basically Hannibal Lecter's origin story. <laughs> it, it, Hannibal Rising is like a Holocaust survival right. action movie almost. Oh, I thought he was saying cannibalism in this movie. I like, there's no cannibalism <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I, I didn't mind Hannibal Rising. I think it's hot garbage. I was also a kid when I saw it. So I did like the actor who played, who played him, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also said his pick-me-up was going to be Pearl Harbor. What the fuck, Melly? 
Not a bad pick. That movie is so fucking wild. And uh, I'll go ahead and give you his clue for what we're talking about next week because it's his pick. And that hint is everything Mally knows about the British royal family he learned from this film. <laughs> oh, 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 boy. <laughs> Oh my god! I what a movie we're gonna be talking about next week. Man, uh, this next episode is gonna go one of two ways. Uh-huh. I'm so curious to see uh, what you guys thought of this movie. I think it's gonna go. <laughs> I think it's gonna go in the wrong direction. Is oh, my boy. prediction. Uh, but we'll see. Okay, we'll see when we get there. Uh, I got some tricks up my sleeve for next week, so don't worry. Uh, that's scary. <laughs> it should be. Almost, when you say tricks, do you mean like uh, penny I'm not for a turning sack. tricks? <laughs> I'm not turning tricks. Is what I mean. Okay, which is way more relevant if you know what the movie is. Uh, um. Well, that's, I think that's it. Priscilla had to step away from, for the remainder of the episode, but I think we're wrapping up here anyway. Yeah. Grave of the Fireflies. Great movie. You should check it out if you haven't already. Um, and check out our show next week when we return. Mm-hmm. Any, any final words, Nathan, before we get out of here? No, man, I'm tired. Yeah. Like this is, this movie is just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it really sucks your soul out, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're going to be doing two episodes today. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Buckle the fuck up. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got too. So, um, thank you for listening, everybody. Rest in peace, Oatmeal. And I guess I should also say rest in peace, Sato and, uh, Setsuko. Yeah. And, uh, the firefly she crushed in her hand too. Oof. And, uh, as always, fuck that ant. Excelsior? <laughs> uh, and I promise we'll be much more lively next week, everybody. Don't worry. <laughs> Excelsior! 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 Oh. Look it up! believe your eyes the grave of the fireflies <laughs> hello youtube if you've made it this far thanks could you do us one more favor could you hit those like and subscribe buttons maybe leave us a comment on what you think of the show we'd really appreciate it join us again next week for an all-new episode bye <laughs>